Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. What a night this has been. Rainy and snowy outside, but it's been warm in here. And I love, I know Kevin and Lisa, and wow, I, I'm touched by that. And Re, was it Rini? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think I'm in love. <laughs> wow. Wow. One of the great questions that scientists are grappling with these days is really a simple one. And it goes something like this. How do you begin to explain that there's such an intelligence gap between what they call the human animal and the rest of the created order, the other animal order? If evolution is as they say it is and things evolve from the simple to the more complex, how do you begin to explain that humans, people, are more intelligent than animals. Why is there not an intermediate creature of some kind, not as smart as humans, but smarter than the animals that would explain the bridge? And, and they're grappling with that. Now, that is not to say that animals cannot be very intelligent, right? We all know about how intelligent the mammal dolphins are. We know about elephants, how intelligent. Uh, we talk about the memory of the elephant. And of course, there are apes that are very, very intelligent. But people, an ape in Asia, cannot communicate with an ape in Africa. Uh, humans can do that. Apes cannot build this metal cylinder, put wings on it, and landing gear, and go from one continent to the next. But uh, humans can. The little beaver that you find on your nickel, <laughs> he can build an incredible home. But he cannot put Wi-Fi in there. He cannot take his uh, cell phone when he's on the other side of the forest and it's getting late and he wants to put his porch light on. He cannot use his cell phone to turn up the heat if he wants to come home in an hour and come home to a toasty home. He can't do that. But people can. And so can, scientists will continue to try to figure that one out. Now, if I could say humbly, I think I know the answer to that question that the human animal is really not an animal at all. We're distinct from the animal order. We're created in the image of God, and that might begin to explain why humans have this intelligence, if you will. But they'll try to figure it out. Now, would you be surprised to learn that the Bible actually talks about this intelligence gap? But it's not what you might think. The Bible doesn't ask the question, why is it that humans are more intelligent than animals? It asks a different question, and it's a little embarrassing. The question that the Bible asks is, why is it that sometimes animals are more intelligent than people? And one of the classic Bible verses on that is in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3. I discovered this verse when I was a child, and it's always imprinted itself on my mind. And it goes something like this. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. But God says, Israel does not know, and my people do not understand. Go up to any donkey or any burro, and he burrow any, any oxen and say, who's your master? They say, that's easy. It's the guy that brings me my hay. It's that guy over there. He's got uh, the farmer's tan. He's got the John Deere cap on. He's got that little piece of grass sticking out of his, that, that's my master. But then God says, but my people, <laughs> my people do not know who their master is. They do not know who provides for them. You see, there's a, a little intelligence gap. And uh, this evening, I want us to talk from a delightful little passage of Scripture in Proverbs chapter 30. You might not be familiar with it. It's kind of tucked there in the back of Proverbs, but it is capital D delightful, and it'll warm the cockles of your heart as we look at it. And so let's read it together. Um, Proverbs chapter 30, beginning at verse 24. 
And uh, Solomon isn't writing this, it's Agur, a guy named Agur. You probably haven't heard of him before. I don't know nothing about him, Agur. And he says, four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. They're small, but they're smart. All of you small people, you can, um, that's okay. You can make up for that if you're smart. Four things are small, but they're smart. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Hyraxes, we're going to talk about what a hyrax is. Uh, I don't think they have them in the Calgary Zoo, by the way. Are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. A crag is a crack. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. The lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. Let's look at these four little critters, I call them, and see why they're so smart and to find out if, um, if um, maybe they're a little smarter than we are, okay? Okay, well, let's see. Ants, it says, are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. When the Bible says that ants are creatures of little strength, it's speaking comparatively. <laughs> Comparatively speaking, uh, ants are not as strong as some of the much larger animals in the animal kingdom. But relatively speaking, ants are very smart, or very strong. Did you know that an ant can lift up to 20 times its weight? Did you know that? Uh, we sometimes see them, right, scurrying around with refuse from the forest floor, a little pine needle or a leaf or something like that, or sometimes they're stealing a part of a sandwich from our picnic. They're, they're very strong. If I had to lift 20 times my weight, I weigh almost 200 pounds, I'd have to lift 4,000 pounds. They're very, very strong, but they're smart because the Bible says that they prepare their food in the summer. In the day of opportunity, when there's lots of food around, they, they gather it and they protect it for the winter time when there will be no food. They are prepared. So I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about preparing for the future. And I want to begin by talking to young people because I, I love young people. Young people, it's important for you to prepare for the future because you are going to spend the rest of your life there. And that one of the first things, young people, you need to do is get an education. I want to talk about education for a moment. When we come into this world, we come into this world with an empty brain. Let's call it the brain bucket, an empty bucket. And one of the first challenges of your young life is to pour learning and education into your bucket brain. And so you start doing that through what is called mandatory education. You go to elementary school, you go to a junior high school, you go to high school, and by the time you graduate in grade 12, you've poured a little bit of learning and education into your bucket. But I have something to tell you. It is not enough after your grade 12 education, you do not have enough education poured into your bucket. And one of the first great tests, listen, I see young people all the way up front here, one of the first great tests of your life is simply this, will you continue to pour education and learning into your bucket brain? You have to care about this. You have to care about your future because you are going to spend the rest of your life there. Some of you will uh, go to university, but university isn't for everybody in this modern age. Going to a technical school like Sate or Nate may be a better option for you. But no matter, you have to get some kind of skill training. It might be an apprenticeship of some kind. Yeah, it might be some kind of certification. 
But in this modern world that we live in, you have to discover what, where the jobs of the future are. And you have to prepare yourself for the future. Now maybe you came to, to church tonight and you wanted to hear a sermon about the love of God and, 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 and his wonderful matchless grace and all that. And that is, that we, we hear many sermons about that from Pastor Henry, Pastor Ashwin, and that's what our church believes in with all of our hearts. But it's a long weekend tonight, and so we're just going to be, uh, it's just going to be a little bit different. We're, 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 we're speaking from Proverbs chapter 30, and it is just as inspired as John 3.16. It really is. And so we're, we're just talking practically tonight, okay? Young people, you have to prepare for the future. Because too many young people at this point, they take a little detour, or they're going to take some time off, or you may be in your 20s or something, and you've never gone back to school to fill up your bucket. It is a mistake because in this modern world, employers pay for skills, and you need to have skills. You need to care about the future because you're going to spend the rest of your life there. If you do not listen to me, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, I have something to tell you. There is an anthill not far away from us. I don't know where it is, but in that anthill, there's an ant of just average intelligence. Not a particularly smart ant, he's just an average ant. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I have to tell you that that ant may be smarter than you are because that little ant knows that you have to prepare for the future. Um, money, let's talk about money for a moment. Because some of you are not prepared for the future when it comes to money. You are so locked into today that you're not preparing for tomorrow. You have so much stress in your financial life today. I mean, it's just overwhelming. You can't begin to think of saving for the future. Some of you are spending more than you're making. And that is a problem. Some of you are under incredible financial stress. The visa bill comes, the utility bills come, and it's so overwhelming, you just throw them on the pile. Somehow you figured out what, more, what minimum payments are. And every day, we think about money every day, right? You can't go a day in your life without thinking of money. It's, we're in our wallets every day. Every day you have incredible financial stress, and you can't even begin to prepare for the future. I'm going to be talking in just a few minutes about maybe something that you can do about that. But we are living in a day, and our, the government of Canada is, con the government of Canada is doing everything it can to get people to save for the future. And it's like speaking to a brick wall because Canadians nowadays, and many of us in this room, we, we, we either won't or we can't. Now, just let me say one last little thing. I know some of you are, have had bad things happen. Maybe you've had a marriage separation or divorce and your money got all messed up or you've lost your job. I, I, I want to be sensitive to that. But what I'm trying to communicate to you is that we have lost this mindset that we have to save. And some of you might be thinking, I can smell it. Well, this isn't very spiritual, all this conversation. It is spiritual because it is not the will of God that you live under financial pressure. Um, uh, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 25 is a very spiritual verse you have to save. In the day of opportunity, because there's coming a day. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But somewhere not far away is a little anthill, and in that anthill there's an ant of average intelligence, and he might be smarter than some of us. Because he knows that you have to save for the future. It's overwhelming, isn't it? You know, there's something else we need to prepare for. Nobody's talking about this anymore. But it's eternity. Eternity. Again, we are so locked into today, we're not thinking about that time when we're going to die. And, and there are, there's, there's somebody here, you're not prepared for eternity. That is a terrible mistake. 
You're prepared for maybe life after work, but you're not prepared for life after life. In June, I am having a birthday with a zero, and I am not happy about it. <laughs> I am seriously thinking of protesting. Warren, why are you so grouchy about this? I'll tell you why. It wasn't so long ago I was 40, and I remember saying to myself, well, I've lived half my life. For every day that I've had, I have one day left. And that was sobering to me. In June, I will only have half of my half left. Now you know how old I'm going to be. Half of my half. The thing that's staggering to me is it's, it's, um, it's just gone by so quickly. I hear almost every week of somebody who's terminal, and I'm starting to think, whoa, I'm terminal. And so are you but you never think about it. You know, when we head downtown to McLeod Trail, we drive right through, you know, if you're heading north up McLeod Trail to downtown, we pass through a cemetery, the old cemetery, Union Cemetery, one on each side of the road. I always say it's good for us to drive through cemeteries. It's good for us to go to funerals because it's a reminder that we are in the queue and one day it's going to be our time. I highly recommend the Lord Jesus to you. It would be a good thing on the day that when you pass to the other side, the Lord Jesus was standing there by your side to speak up for you. That would be a very good thing. Somewhere nearby is an anthill. And on that anthill, there's an ant. He's not a particularly brilliant ant, he's just an average ant. You know, we stomp on them at our picnics. Some of you are going to go to the garden center this weekend, and you're going to buy an, an ant spray, and you're going to kill all the ants in your garden. You're going to kind of think in your mind, what dumb little ants, you know, kill them all. I kill ants. But I just want you to remember one thing. They're smart. And they know something that many people do not know. There is a second animal called the hyrax. Uh, some translations say rock badger. The, 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 the Bible scholars are not exactly sure what this is, but it's, it's, it's an animal that lives in the crags. I think it's like our marmot. Do you know what a marmot is? Some of you new Canadians, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but we're going to have a picture. Do we have some pictures of a marmot up there? Uh, the Bible says that he makes his home in the crags, is he up there? There he is. What a cute little guy. He makes his home in the crags or in the cracks. And the reason he does that is because there are lurking grizzly bears and he knows that he's no match for a grizzly bear. But if he can stay near the rocks and near the cracks, when the grizzly bear comes, he is safe. He can even do one of these to the grizzly bear uh, when he's in the crags because he is in a safe place. He knows where to go. He knows where to go, and he knows that he cannot do this on his own. One of the things I've discovered in my ministry with people is that people, when they're in crisis, they often become paralyzed, and they do not know where to go. And they try to fight their grizzly bears the giants in their lives all by themselves. And that is a mistake. I know that there's some of you in this room, you have relational problems. You might be going through tremendous marriage difficulties. Oh, you tried to go see a counselor once and that somehow didn't seem to work. You know, there are good counselors and there are bad counselors. Maybe just you know, good, good Christian counselors and they're bad Christian counselors, sure. They're, just because you're a Christian counselor, you're a good counselor. You see, you've got you to go again, but you've, you've got to get help. There are people who have a gift of healing, people who have a skill at understanding relationships and understanding brokenness and understanding how they can maybe begin to help you. But you can't give up, you have to go. Leanne and I, we, um, 
We dated for two years before we got married, and we kind of knew after several months that we were going to get married. But one day we're driving back from Banff, and uh, I, I thought everything was going okay. And uh, Leanne uh, says to me, the drive back from Banff, she says, I'm, I will not marry you. That, that got my attention. She said, I will not marry you unless you promise me if at any point in our marriage I feel that we need counseling, you'll agree to go to counseling with me. I said, are you kidding me? I said, I am a pastor. I will never need marriage counseling. I did. She said, okay, have a nice life, <laughs> but I ain't going to be part of it. And I said, okay, I promise. And she said, furthermore, if at any point in our marriage you feel that we need marriage counseling, I promise you that we'll go for marriage counseling. Two years into our marriage, one day she says to me, Warren, we need to go for marriage counseling. I said, no. She said, you promised. And the pastor went for marriage counseling. And it's the best thing I ever did. Now, in our uh, meeting tonight, there are some sweethearts, I'm sure. You ask this person that you might be marrying, that you're engaged to, you make the same contract with them. And if they do not make that contract with you, get rid of them. It's not meant to be. <laughs> why? No, why are you laughing? <laughs> why would you marry somebody who says they love you but they don't love you enough to make that kind of a contract with you. Every married couple should make that, or engaged couple should make that contract so that when the day of struggle comes, you go and you get help and there's no discussion to be made. Some of you, we talked earlier about finances and it is stressful for you. In my small group, we have a, a couple uh, I love them to pieces. About five years ago, they were tens of thousands of dollars in debt and living under incredible pressure. At the time, we had in our church a thing called Financial Peace University, and they were desperate, and they went. They got some help. They learned some principles. They got the skills that they need to manage money. And today... They are living in the gravy. In a time of trouble, you have got to know where to go. You've got to know that you cannot solve every problem by yourself. Somewhere in the Rocky Mountains is a little marmot running around in the rocks. Well, he's not tonight because it's rainy, he's in his crag. He's not a particularly brilliant marmot. He's a marmot of average intelligence, but he's smarter than some of us because he knows where to go and he knows what to do. We just had a freedom session in our church a couple of weeks ago and 120 people graduated from freedom session. <laughs> Applause, please. These were people who had addiction issues. These were people who, who were, they were held back by their past and by so, much things, so many things that bound them. And are they all perfect right now? No, they're not. But I want to tell you, they're on the way to recovery. God is working in their life. But there came a point in their life where they had to say, I need help. And some of you need to go to a freedom session, but you will not go because you're proud. And somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, there's a little marmot right now. He's not particularly intelligent. He's just a marmot of average intelligence. But he's, he knows something that you don't know. Some of you have anger problems. And it's a, your wife knows it, your family knows it. But apparently you don't. I introduced to you the marmot. I know that there are people who have anxiety issues. 
you're anxious all the time. You thought that what, what anxiety is, it's, it's worry times 10. Anxiety has absolutely nothing to do with worry. It's something chemical inside of you, and you have tried to be happy, and you have tried to be at peace, and you need to go see a doctor. You need to pray with all of your heart, and you need to go see a doctor. Did you know that one in four of us has a mental illness of some kind? Did you know that Pastor Warren has a mental illness? Diagnosed, certified? It's okay. It happens. Some of you are depressed. You're depressed all the time and you try not to be depressed and you try to be happy around your family, but it's killing you. We're talking about your future. You have to care about your future because that's where you're going to spend the rest of your life. You have to go for help. There are people who are trained to help you and maybe you tried once or twice and it didn't work or you know this whole medication thing and you became discouraged. You can't give up. You got to keep trying. You can't do this on your own and you cannot give up. You, you just keep trying. You've got to get healthy and sometimes it takes a while and you can be helped. You don't have to live like this. The little marmot. He knows where to go. One more little critter. One more little critter. He's called a locust. We know about locusts. It says in verse 27, locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. Locusts have no king, they advance together in ranks. You know that when you get enough locusts together, marching together in ranks, they can put a human army to flight? There are few things more powerful on this earth than an army of these little critters, locusts. There is no prime minister, locust. There is no king, locust. No boss, locust. Every little locust knows what to do without being told. Every little locust does the right thing to do simply because it's the right thing to do. And they are one of God's amazing little creatures that have a lesson to tell. Why is it that people always need to be told what to do? Teenagers, can I, you know, I love you guys. <laughs> I've got a great recipe for you to get your parents off the back, off your back. This is a winner. If you do what I'm going to tell you to do, they will never ever bother you again. And here's what you need to do. In yourself, you need to do the right thing by yourself. Just do the right thing by yourself, just because it's the right thing to do, and they will never bother you again. Your dad is away on a business trip. There's a foot of snow on the driveway. And your dear old mom, you know, she's, you know, she's looking after the other kids. Your mom has to tell you to shovel the driveway? Like, are you serious? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Shovel the driveway. Because it's the right thing to do. Um, <laughs> You know, the curfew is midnight, right? And uh, you're having a good time. And what happens when you're having a good time? Time goes by quickly. Your parents have to tell you to call, just, you know, just to send. I mean, you've already sent 700 texts that day. Send one more and just tell your parents you're going to. You have to be told that? Like, really? Our young people are exceptional. They're intelligent. I see in you maturity and independence and strength. Young people, do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. You can do that. Some of you men, there's a, a railing that's broken in your house and your wife has been telling you for months, fix the, ra fix the railing. Are you kidding me? She has to tell you that? <laughs> Why don't you just do the right thing? 
because it's the right thing to do. Somewhere in a field nearby, there's a locust. He's not a very smart locust. He's just average intelligence. But, do we always need a policeman around to tell us what to do? On your way to work, you know where the photo traps are, where the radar traps are, so when you go by those radar traps, you're nice and slow, but you know where they're not. And you drive like, 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 like terrible, fast. None of you in this room text and drive or use your cell phone and drive. You wouldn't do that, really? You always need a policeman telling you what to do. Why don't you just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do? Do you need a pastor telling you what to do? You know, our pastors, they should be preaching about the glory and the majesty and the awesome grace of God. They should be preaching about the gospel. We shouldn't have to spend five seconds talking about what people should do. Because people should do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. And so I just want to challenge you to try and change your thinking a little bit. Be proactive. Be self-governing. There's a novel concept. I am going to look after myself. I'm not going to waste other people's energy because they always have to tell me what to... I'm just going to do the right thing. I'm going to grow up. And I'm going to be mature. And I'm going to be independent. I'm going to stop. We're going to talk maybe, who knows, who knows, maybe talk about the little lizard who lives in a king's palace. No, uh, some of you live in very nice homes, right? You uh, may live in uh, Panorama Hills or Martindale. You live in a very nice home, but I doubt there's anybody here that lives in a king's palace, right? I just, just doubt that. Uh, but the little lizard does, or he can. So he must be pretty smart, right, to live in a king's palace, and who knows? But we've said enough. I just want to conclude with this. Pastor Ashwin and I have been talking about making decisions. And the word decide is a very, very interesting word. It ends in C-I-D-E, side. All the words in the English language that end in side have to do with death. Homicide. Suicide. Genocide. Infanticide. Um, you want to kill your bugs? Pesticide. You want to kill your weeds? Herbicide. All the words in the English language that end in side have to do with death. And then we come to the word decide. Because in the decisions that we make, there are life and death implications. Start preparing for the future, whether it's your education or whether it's your finances or friends, if it's your eternity, life and death. Know where to go for help. Do the right thing just for no other reason. It's the right thing to do. The animals have preached the sermon this morning. Listen to them. They are small, but they are are smart. I'm not going to pray to close our service. I've worked hard enough. You're going to close in prayer and you're just going to talk to the Lord about one little thing that maybe has spoken to your heart, one little thing that you're going to change in your life. Let's bow. Amen. If you'd like to come and pray with people, we'll be here up at the front. Have a good rest of the rainy, long weekend. God bless you. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.